Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kurt Greenbaum, Communications Director for WashU Olin Business School and host of Olin's podcast, On Principle. Thank you for joining us. At WashU Olin, we're proud to bring you the Leadership Perspective Series, featuring insightful discussions with an impressive lineup of speakers from various perspectives. We're a community dedicated to pursuing new ideas and taking on challenges. We believe events like this contribute to meaningful insights and bring you to the gateway of ideas, innovation, and inspiration. Today's topic is a great one. Our guest speaker, Ben Rosencrans, and his former professor, Peter Baumgarten, will discuss the sports business and the use of data analytics to drive a franchise's strategy. For those of you who have seen the movie or read the book, and I've done both, this is Moneyball stuff. Our guest speaker will give us an insider's view on interpreting analytics to aggregate human behavior and reveal patterns that lead to strategic decision-making. It's the kind of decision-making that ties to Olin's values-based data-driven leadership philosophy. After Ben and Peter's discussion, they'll answer a few of your questions. So please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit your questions. In just a moment, you'll meet our guest speaker, but first I'd like to introduce today's moderator, P Peter Baumgarten. Peter is the Koch Family Professor of Practice in Family Enterprise and the director of the Koch Center for Family Enterprise. He joined Olin's faculty in 2018 and is an alum of our PhD program. Across his work, Peter likes to say he lives at the intersection of theory and practice, design and delivery, values and data. He teaches courses on leadership, organizational design, and strategic management within Olin's undergraduate, MBA, executive MBA, and executive education programs. Peter's research focuses on the role of structure, both formal and informal, in shaping the innovation of groups, organizations, and broader network systems. And in addition to his academic work, he has consulted for and run executive education programs with organizations across sectors, often focusing on refining their strategic direction, enhancing leadership development, and cultivating routes to drive increased innovation. Ben and Peter, I'm sure our audience is ready for you to begin your discussion, so I'll turn things over to Peter to introduce Ben and start the conversation. Take it away, Peter. I had I had one request for this event, and it was that I would not have to follow the voice of Wash U and the podcast. And this is what they ended up putting me behind. So thank thank you again, Kurt. Uh, I'm going to pull Ben onto the discussion here. Um, looking forward to today's discussion. Ben is the director of strategy and analytics at the Blackhawks. Uh, probably most of what he's known for, however, is being a, a TA in my uh, marketing strategy course and organizational behavior course back in 20, uh, 2017. So I'm assuming that's at least on the top of your resume, Ben, but uh, maybe not the top, but at least top two or three points. Uh, but great to have you here. Looking forward to the discussion. You can see by the number of attendees here, there's a lot of interest in the stuff that you're going to be talking about that we'll be talking about today. So looking forward to that discussion here. Now, I, I could read off your bio. I could read off the things that you've done over the years, but I wonder if you might start by giving us a bit of, a bit of narrative um, starting from kind of what made you land at WashU, um, your formative TA experiences, of course, and then afterwards, what your progression looked like in the context of sports and business. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I appreciate you having me. I think uh, WashU has obviously been crucial to my experience in, in getting me here. Um, I went to WashU um, because uh, I, I wanted to study business. I, like most uh, young folks, I think mostly just know what your parents do. Uh, my dad was in finance, my mom was in marketing, so uh, I wanted to go study business and get a degree in finance and marketing. Um, so that was sort of my context for showing up at WashU, plus uh, I was on the track and cross country teams. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have done that at WashU, and that's a whole nother, uh, you know, time for a whole nother day. Um, but sort of started at WashU, uh, was in the business school, had a great experience through undergrad, um, actually had some leftover 
uh, eligibility for cross country and was looking around trying to figure out uh, how I could stick around for a fifth year and, and keep college going um, and, and sort of stumbled across the, the master's in analytics programs that at that point were relatively new at Olin. Um, and that was unequivocally one of the luckiest things I've ever stumbled into. Uh, I started that programming my senior year around the time I, I started TAing for you. So maybe I'm conflating the the impacts here. So, um, so it's hard to remember which one was which, you know. Absolutely. Um, but started taking those courses and, and realized that uh, that there was sort of a missing piece to to what I was what I thought I was interested in. Um, and this concept of data really helped me connect what I thought was really interesting, which was consumer behavior and, and why we all do what we do, and then how that applies to strategic decisions in business. Um, and the ability to sort of critically analyze these questions and understand the patterns that uh, we all sort of, I found it fascinating how we all act in these these ways that you know, at face value may seem uh, odd or suboptimal, um, but when you sort of look at it across the the population or the group that you're looking at, um, I found that there were these really interesting patterns and things I wanted to learn more about. So, uh, Ben, just to, just to pause you there before we kind of talk yeah. about your journey afterwards, uh, and I'm going to do this because I think that perhaps your father is on the line here. So we're going to do some like nice like <laughs> psychoanalytic reading of you here. Um, Love this. But but this process from early on thinking about analytics and, and business, or maybe even marketing and business in particular, to then all of a sudden having this impactful cross-country career, that's a, a central part of you, how you think about your identity. You've always been kind of a lifelong sports fan. Did these things come together that all of a sudden you kind of wanted to do it, but you didn't think there was a career pathway forward? Or was it was it something that all of a sudden like it, it clicked at a certain point where it was like analytics could be applied to what I like to do from from a passion standpoint as well. Tell, tell me a bit about how the sports piece emerged in that cocktail. Yeah, I think the sports piece definitely came a little bit later. Um, I was always interested in it. I always worked in it. Um, I have very distinct memories of going to uh, baseball games as a kid and we'd go to the ballpark tours and different things before the game. And I thought the people walking around the concourse, the empty concourses before the games with the little credentials on were the coolest people on the face of the planet. Um, and so I always knew I had this interest um, but it wasn't something that I really explored. Obviously, the industry is pretty tricky to get into, um, and you never really know where your opportunities are going to come from. So uh, I knew it was a big thing in sports. I knew it was an area of interest of mine. Um, and it, it, it's as it turns out, you know, having those concrete skills and analytics, having those things that I could turn to, those experiences, and quite frankly, a really strong medium. Obviously, sports is a great medium for analytics because there is so much data. Um, being able to work on those projects as a student and immediately post-grad really helped me set up my resume and create a path for me in sports um, that would have looked obviously very different before I'd broken into the analytics world. Great. So essentially then you hit the end of your time here, you're doing a couple of projects, you really zeroed in on analytics, then taking us from 2018 to now here we are in 2023, five years later, what have been some of the key milestones along that journey? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been very fortunate to sort of sort of fallen into a lot of really cool opportunities. The first one was working with Budweiser uh, as an internship uh, in a lot of their sports marketing and sponsorship. Um, this was 2016, so the year of the Olympics and the Copa America soccer tournament. So got exposed to a lot of cool uh, events from the brand side. Um, transitioned, as I mentioned, to the analytics side and got an internship with a company called E15 Group uh, that then I went to full-time after graduation. E15 is, is the an analytics consulting firm for uh, one of the major concessions companies. So they do the concessions at 200 stadiums or something around the, the U.S., um, we did all the analytics around food and beverage, retail, and a lot of fan experience work. So graduated from WashU, came back home to Chicago, uh, had the opportunity to work at Wrigley Field, which was as someone who grew up on the north side of Chicago. That alone was basically a dream come true to show up to Wrigley for work every day, um, but did all sorts of work around uh, all of our pricing, did some work on the Wrigley Field renovations, um, and sort of generally working to optimize our food and beverage and retail business. Um, and then from there was fortunate enough, uh, I got exposed obviously to both the work at the Cubs and then the broader portfolio of E15 partners. Um, and then a couple of years ago, right after the pandemic, uh, came over here to the Blackhawks uh, to start our uh, business strategy analytics department. So I've been here for about three years or just under three years, first focused primarily on the analytics side of the house and data science. Um, and now broadened out to 
uh, a little bit more of our digital marketing work, um, obviously maintaining the analytics and data science, as well as a lot of our long-term corporate strategy uh, projects. And, and you'll realize this about Ben pretty quickly. He's a pretty humble guy, but I think what's interesting is uh, you kind of buried the lead there, uh, meaning in the last three years, you've really, you and a small set of team really had to kind of build up this, this analytics capability from ground up. And uh, really over 24 months, 36 months, it's been this process building up. And uh, part of the reason I was excited to talk to you about this is we're going to talk a bit about sports analytics, which will be great. Uh, we're going to talk about sports analytics outside of the on the field analytics, which is what people tend to think of the money ball stuff. Uh, but then there is this story, which is how do you build analytics capability inside inside a business, right? So maybe, maybe you're sitting here and you've got you know, mid-sized manufacturing firm that you're part of, and you have zero analytics capabilities and you've got 200, 300 employees. But why don't you walk us through that process in particular? You come in as kind of employee number two or three on this group, and then now it's closer to 20 later on. G give us a sense on where you started from and the process to get to today. Yeah, so we were we were fortunate enough. I mean, we had uh, a, a one poor soul uh, who was taking on the brunt of the analytics work uh, prior to us coming on because it His wasn't a focus. Was of the, no, yeah. <laughs> before uh, the prior regime. Um, and so we came in and, and sort of looked at, you know, we were very fortunate that we had buy-in from leadership right away. Our, our team president uh, comes from the analytics background. She knows the importance of analytics and strategy and really infusing it in our, our organization. Um, so our team is, is sort of structured from the top as far as, uh, you know, the core departments of the Blackhawks are, our marketing group, our revenue group, and our business strategy and analytics team. Um, and that really enables us to be a connector and uh, and sort of be part of a lot of the conversations and integrate analytics and strategy into a lot of the conversations. Um, you know, we were very fortunate to have that org buy-in. And then, uh, you know, a lot of it came from small incremental process or, or progress that came over time. We we're very, very focused on how do we win over uh, and gain the trust of an organization that has been incredibly successful over a long period of time? How do we provide value in the short term? How do we set the groundwork for value in the long term? I, my boss drove me crazy by constantly harping on the concept of, of small wins. Um, where are the places where we know we are trying to set a groundwork to make the organization healthier and make decisions that will pay off five or 10 years down the line? But where can we pay off whether it's you know direct business impacts, revenues, and things like that in the short term, or where can it pay off as far as providing data and information to our partners and to uh, other members of the organization, automating processes that are maybe taking a significant amount of their time. And all of those things required us to just essentially dive into the organization. It mm. required us to build a lot of relationships um, and do a lot of things that have nothing to do with analytics, um, mm. because that's essentially what was required for us to to gain the trust, to build the baseline, and then to be able to grow uh, from there. Yeah, so I, I want to think then about some of your competitors as a comparison, right? I won't have you call out any of them, especially any of the St. Louis teams here. Um, but imagine you look at a team on the bottom tier, not a performance, but of analytics capabilities, and let's imagine that you're in the top tier of analytics capabilities, at least in terms of uh, team size and, and the things mm -hmm. that you're doing. What are the core differences there? Like, what are the tasks that you're tasked with? How do you make decisions in a different way? What does the decision-making process look like in comparison to San Jose Sharks or whatever the group might be right. that comes to mind for you? Yeah, so I, I think there's a couple things, and and this will be a theme of, if I'm sure, because it's now come up twice. It, it really does come down to how tightly we integrate our data into our day to day operations, and that strategic mindset. Um, at the end of the day, uh, don't let anybody know a data person said this, but data can say a lot of different things, and not all of them are true. Um, and so by just looking at the data that the business spits out um, without truly understanding what's going on underneath the hood, truly understanding what the business problem is we're trying to solve or what the use case is that, that led to that decision, it's sort of a garbage in, garbage out. So we've essentially you know, invested in our BSA group as, as a little bit of the central nervous system as a connector between all of the different departments and, and truly embedding our team. We've got analysts embedded with our revenue group, analysts embedded with our marketing group. So we generally have sort of three main functions that we 
sort of rely on our team for. The first is as that embedded data manager, data analysis, um, automation, sort of who are these, the, the technical folks who understand the, the analytics side of things and understand modeling or business intelligence and things like that. Um, who we want to teach the business side of things and connect them with business partners so that they can inform day-to-day -day business decisions. The second thing we'll do a lot of as a team is what we call our internal consultancy. So special projects, things that come up where we need to add resourcing. Uh, one of the recent examples is we're expanding our practice facility. Um, so a significant percentage of our team has spent the last year focused on that project, doing financial modeling, doing uh, strategic positioning in the market, understanding um, you know, construction timelines and, uh, you know, the financials of, of every component of uh, a project of that size, um, as well as on the digital side. So that's a physical example, but, uh, being that consultant on the digital side, what are the digital projects that we need to develop? Um, and, uh, one of the ways that, you know, you mentioned, how are we different? Uh, we have the resources in house to do digital product development, similar to the soccer team in St. Louis. Um, we have the resources to take on some of these construction projects that would be uh, pushed externally uh, to other consultants. And I think the third piece that that we lead is a strategy analytics group and where we step in and uh, compared to a lot of other organizations in sports is uh, a little bit of an incubator. So if there is a new department or a new program we want to start, um, a lot of times it'll start first in our department. We'll build out the business case, how that business should run, um, get things off the ground, understand the tech stack, whatever might be required with our partner departments um, before we'll actually formally spin that out. So something like a game used gear program um, is something that hadn't had you know super large penetration in the Blackhawks in the past. It'll be something that we would take on that project, uh, work to build out what the business model should look like and, and what the purpose of that program should be. Um, and then we'll slowly work to scale that back out to the team in our department that'll be running it long term into the future. Right. So I want to think now from the perspective of the team president. So team president, I'm guessing, responds to GM or perhaps the owners. Uh, there's some sort of kind of need to justify this expense. Team president comes in and says, hey, look, I want to build a team of 20. And imagine they start to do some backup napkin calculations and team of 20 at $100,000 a person, $2 million at $200,000 a person, $4 million. That's a pretty significant investment in a capability. And I can imagine the owners saying, you know, that sounds great, but you know, those San Jose Sharks, uh, I'm really showing my limited number of teams that are outside of St. Louis or Chicago. Um, they, uh, you know, they get by on four or five people and they seem to be doing great. They in fact outsource it a little bit. So that drives up the costs a little bit, but if you were the team president having to make a justification on why you need 15, 20, 25 people to do this kind of work well, what what is your case for the ROI of this investment? Yeah, so it, it's a couple things. One, we have an extremely ambitious organization. Uh, we have an extremely ambitious ownership. We have extremely ambitious president and, and GM on the hockey side. Um, and I think that in, in this context helps us. It obviously helps us sort of across the board, but um, it, it enables us to say, yes, we want to be able to do these things. We've sort of sold this big vision and now we need the people in place to be able to execute it. And often we are the group that is being in, put in place to be able to develop internal products and internal processes um, at a scale of it that nobody else is doing. Um, so the larger the ambitions, the more uh, our team is able to step in because of the background in special projects, because of the background in technology, because we've got sort of a diverse group here that can support the variety of things that are going on in the organization. Um, that provides us a lot of opportunity in order to get that support um, because we are all aligned from the organization at the top down that we want to fundamentally change in certain ways how sports teams are doing business. Um, and we want to be the ones that are building the tools, building the products and building the solutions that'll be able to do that. So that's the super big picture version. Um, right. I think when it comes to the day to day, there's two things that that help us um, and that we strive for. One I already touched on, which is the small wins. Um, I really view our team as, as supporters. 
we're supporters first, we're resources. Um, our job is to make our partners look good, our department partners, um, the folks that are sort of making the decisions on the individual channels or in our individual marketing channels, um, making sure they have the resources to do their job, making sure we're providing them insights in order to increase the KPIs and things that they're working towards. Um, and we know we've done a good job when they are the ones that are advocating for us. Um, and so that's what we strive for all the time is that uh, the, you know, the partners and the other departments that we're working with and we're supporting day in and day out, we're doing it in a manner that um, they're the ones that are coming to the table and saying, yes, this group, this analytics team is providing me value. They're making it easier for me to do my job. They're increasing my uh, capabilities and my uh, my group in the day to day. Um, and and that's why we take sort of that approach of trying to be partner first and, and trying to be really embedded in the business. I think the other thing that helps is we have a few key projects where we can put really big numbers up uh, of what the impact of our department is. Every year we go through ticket pricing or we go through major um, sort of revenue initiatives and we're able to do things uh, in a way that, you know, historically our organization had not been able to do them uh, because they hadn't invested in this resource. And we have a pretty good A-B test of um, what it means to invest in this department, what the impact is, um, and we're constantly putting these things together. We have uh, folders of case studies um, sort of documenting these small wins and uh, showing monetarily where the impact has been on some of these key projects. All right. So let me just see if I can kind of pull these pieces out and then I want to do a couple of rapid fire questions, but it sounds like some of the justification can be based on some of these big wins that can either be looked at historically. So this year with dynamic ticket pricing, we ended up having a higher percentage of tickets sold at the same level of wins than we had last year or at a higher average ticket price per, per particular ticket. Um, and perhaps also through kind of an A-B testing. So not a historic comparison, but we ran this particular strategy across two different groups. And now we know that this strategy works and it has 5% benefit in terms of our cost savings. And so therefore let's now scale it across the organization. Is that a fair way to think about the ways that you would make your cases for why it's better? Absolutely. And I think it, to your point, it, it's a lot of it is small. It can be small scale or it can be larger scale. It can be A-B tests and specific experiments we run sort of day to day uh, in channels where we can control it, or they can be uh, based on the outputs of our models where we're able to sort of understand the uh, the counterfactual a little bit and say, you know, we think this is the optimal pricing strategy and this is the impact of that pricing strategy. Um, and, 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 sort of being able to, to put those bigger numbers out there that that show the impact of, of what we're trying to do. Yep. I want to go to two, uh, two scenarios here, a little bit rapid fire on this one. And then we're going to transition after talking about building analytics capabilities to some of the interesting trends in analytics and sports. Um, but I want to imagine now back three years ago, uh, you took this role. Uh, so three years ago, I guess it was late 2020. What was the timing? Mid 2020? Uh, or very early 21. Early 20, so not quite, yes, not quite three years. Yeah. A little, a little under a year post COVID, you take this new role. Yeah. You've got two or so people, two or three people early on this team. Uh, what are the five most important first hires you would make? It may not be exactly what you did, but if you were to go back in yeah. time and say, I would hire at this level of seniority, this particular talent, what, what would they be? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the first thing, and this won't directly answer your question, but the biggest thing that we have found is incredibly value on our team is the concept of diversity of thought. Um, and it, it was sort of something that came from E15 where, uh, you know, the basis of that company was creating this consulting firm where not only did you have, you know, data engineers and data analysts and data scientists, um, but you also had designers and you had, uh, you know, uh, neuroscientists and you had uh, people who came from a background of psychology, um, really bringing together all those different backgrounds, bringing together some right brain and some left brain, you can apply that diversity of experience to a wide variety of problems. Um, our business is very wide ranging. We've got content elements, we've got real estate elements, we've got marketing elements. We are both a product and a marketing engine. Um, so bringing together that that sort of diversity is really, really important. And so that was something that we focused on uh, as we built, built our team. We've got people from, you know, consulting backgrounds. We've got more creative folks. We've got people from financial backgrounds. We have people with technical backgrounds um, and, and sort of from all over the place who all bring their unique experiences as, as part of that. 
as far as the specifics of what we would do, um, and this was what we tried to do, I think, uh, especially the hiring market in, in 2021 sort of limited what came together in practice a little bit. Um, for us, from an analytics perspective, my first priority is always your technical partner. Uh, who is the person that is going to come in that can build the tools you need um, that can surface? And we've got, you know, 20, 30, 40 different data sources that are coming in at a given point in time that are uh, creating our, our 360 views of our fans. Uh, so bringing in that person that can help not just strategically, at least in a business our side, not just strategically think about the, uh, the data that you want to bring in and, and the size of the business, but, um, someone that can actually get their hands dirty and help develop these things was really important for us. We were very lucky to find, uh, you know, one of our, our director of data science who, who works for us now. Um, so finding that technical first person is first. Um, the other thing that I, I think I underestimated and we were very fortunate to have a very strong person uh, when I showed up uh, was the strategic partner. Um, again, our business is very, uh, it's very wide ranging. It's very flexible. Um, and we've got a relatively small organization. Um, so having someone who is very strategic, who is very much able to break down problems um, into their sort of basic components um, mm. and quickly make work to both manage those products, but also help uh, push those things forward was crucial for us. Um, and then we were very lucky to sort of from there be able to then build out the core analytics functionality. So we had the back end, we had the project um, leadership in the strategic thinking. Um, then it was bringing in the folks that, um, you know, who are, we've got some really, really smart people who are really good at building models, who are good at understanding uh, that angle of things, who are really good at building dashboards and analyzing our business. Um, so I think that was generally our path. That's generally the path that that. I've seen works best when building out these types of teams. So I'm hearing if I were to want to get hired at the Blackhawks, either then or now, I would want to demonstrate core technical chops, uh, the ability to strategically parse a problem, and perhaps the need to or potential benefit of highlighting the diversity of the perspective that I bring to bear on the same sorts of challenges. So I, I don't want to just say I've all, only thought about sports analytics, but you might say, yeah. I worked in public health analytics for a period of time. And, and as a result, when I think about populations of people, this is how I would approach this problem different than what I would see in, in sports. Absolutely. Our, our data scientist came from public policy. And uh, one of his biggest contributions has been that he has that background and understands, then uses that to understand demand models and how markets are moving and how markets are developing. Um, so that's been a huge unlock for us. And, and, and I think the diversity of experiences also comes to the level of specificity. Uh, my background through Olin, because I had that business background in finance and marketing, but also have technical understanding, um, I got it, was able to do some coding. I'm nowhere near a whiz coder, uh, but my contribution in a lot of cases is to be that connector between uh, both the technical side and the non-technical side and more strategic side. Um, but because we had those people, we had a lot of those conversations and really interesting ones between someone who came from that purely strategic background, a purely financial background. Okay, well, how does that then parlay into a ticketing uh, ticketing demand model and uh, how do those, those pieces work together? That's great. Uh, I want to just make a, a quick note to those that are listening in here at about the 515, 520 Mark Central we're going to transition at the tail end of some questions that you have for Ben. So feel free to put those in. I'll keep my eye on them and then we'll hopefully flag a few of them here. Um, but I, I do want to hit maybe one more quick question and then let's talk about kind of the general trends and analytics. Um, Kurt mentioned this up front, but one of the roles I play at WashU is I lead our center for privately held companies, the Koch Center. Um, and there's a lot of companies that are kind of like the Blackhawks in some ways. Uh, and by that, I mean, they are two to 300 employees, a couple hundred million dollars of revenue, maybe analytically less robustly developed. Uh, they might be in less sexy industries. Maybe they're not in sports, but they're in manufacturing or something else. So if, if you were to be sitting down with someone like that, they're an owner of a business. Uh, it's a pretty robust business. It's been growing well. They think there's some trends coming around a space for analytic capability being built in, but they don't know how to do it. Uh, what would you consider or what would you encourage them to consider? What would be some things that you say, you know, if I were you in this space, I would really invest in analytics. Uh, you know, if you do it, make sure that you have a team of five or more. 
Uh, here's when I'd outsource versus keep it in-house. What, what would be the things that yeah. you do if you were sitting with, again, an owner of a 200 person, $200 million organization? Yeah. So I, I think to that last point and to what we've said so far, I'm a big proponent of bringing in at least the core functionality in-house because of what it unlocks as far as integration into the business. Mm-hmm. And I'll say you can... Obviously, analytics can get fairly complicated. It also doesn't have to be. The, the concept of, of Pareto optimization, I think, is very much at play here that you know 80% of the impact is going to come with 20% of the effort. Um, and I love, having, by the way, how you said it doesn't have to be that technical and then you use Pareto optimization. Used but the technical, yeah, that was probably not my, my, <laughs> my finest move. But uh, you know, one of the, the biggest things we look for when we're hiring is curiosity um, because it's especially, you know, most of the work we're doing is not that technical. And what we're really asking someone to do is think through the data that might be coming in and what is the subsequent set of questions that you need to ask, doing nothing more complicated than, you know, add, subtract, divide, multiply. Um, But something as simple as, okay, we've got a concession stand in the stadium. The sales in that concession stand are down. Okay, so is it because we have fewer people per game? If we scale it by the number of people per game, uh, is it, you know, are we having fewer people in that section? Is the number of items people are buying per transaction going down? Is the price of the items they're buying going down or the mix of items that they're buying going down? None of those involves machine learning, AI, anything crazy modeling wise, but there's tremendous information that you can unlock just by breaking down those components. Um, and so that's why we we hire for that curiosity, because I don't need you to, in some roles, we need you to be technical, but to do that 80% that has a lot of impact, it really is just being comfortable asking the right questions in the data. And I think that's something that applies regardless of the business. The biggest unlock is just making sure that you're actually controlling uh, and, and ingesting the data that comes in. Honestly, that's the biggest investment that for a lot of businesses, you know, data is just exhaust. Um, and this was the big thing at E15. Uh, it's element 15, which is phosphorus, the tip of a match. Our goal was to take data from exhaust to fuel um, and sort of cycle it back into the business where we could really use it to drive impact. And I think that is, I think that is attainable regardless of the level of investment. Um, it doesn't need to be super high in order to get, you know, a very high ROI on the front end. That's great. That's great. All right. Let's take a transition into the world of sports analytics. Um, I already have one question in there. I'll do a real quick rapid fire one just because Harry123 wants to know, how do you feel about Patrick Kane signing with the Red Wings, which I, as a Blackhawks fan, am just now hearing about this now. So this is really disheartening for me as a person who hasn't apparently read ESPN enough. How do you feel about it? Yeah, I, I am very excited for him that he was able to come back. As someone who's had hip surgery, although not the hip surgery he had, um, we're all super excited that that he's back in the league and hopefully feeling better. Um you know, I think we're, we're, it'll be interesting to see, uh, he'll be back, uh, February 25th. If anybody wants to come to Chicago, it is the Jersey retirement ceremony of another famous Blackhawk who moved to the Detroit Red Wings, Chris Chelios. So mm. we'll have both of them returning to the ice for the first time, um, which is a fun little, fun little thing that is unique in sports is you never know where the news is going to take you and, and how that's going to affect your life. But I love the uh, analytics going into that decision of how do we time the actual retirement of a Jersey alongside Patrick Kane's return to Chicago? Exactly. I, I wish I had that experience. level of, wish yeah. I had that level of foresight, but. All right. So I've been waiting the entire time to now use my analogy of skating to where the puck is going versus where the puck is at now. Again, I know very little about hockey, but I do know that one. And so I want to take it here and I want to hop into some of the, the things that are on the horizon of sports analytics broadly. Some of those could be tied towards player analytics, team performance analytics. Some of them could be tied towards uh, ticket analytics. Um, I'm guessing that there's probably a lot of discussion around large language models and, and its implications for mining certain things there from the data. But when you think about 2028, 2030, in the context of where the Blackhawks need to go, uh, where teams need to go. What are some of the things that are top of mind for you and your team? Yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned the sports analytics side. I'm fortunate enough that I'm, I've had experiences on both sides. Um, I think that alone has been super interesting over the last five, 10 years and, and will continue to be um, as we've seen teams or, or as we've seen leagues basically get the ability to track players on the field um, and then see their capabilities on the analytics side explode. 
Um, obviously, baseball was the first, the money ball example, um, because everything is relatively static and easy to track in something as simple as a box score. But as we've moved into, you know, 2010, 2015, uh, I think I think NFL was first in putting chips in the pads and the ball. Um, we've seen it with basketball with cameras in the ceiling. And then we were uh, we came online uh, last year or two years ago um, with uh, a combination of the systems to be able to track the puck and the players. Cameras in the um, and, skates. I'm just waiting for you to say cameras in the skates. Yeah, if that's not I, where you're at, that's where the puck is going, Ben. Just that's where it's going. Uh, but it's it truly is incredible. You see, once we have the ability to measure this stuff, the amount of investment and the impact of, of what happens in the sport is, is really amplified. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, teams are really broadening what sort of falls into that. They're, they're spending more time off the ice or, or off the field um, doing things like player development. But especially in hockey, I'm very interested to see as our data continues to get better and our team spends more and more time with it, uh, what interesting insights are going to come out of that and what they're going to uncover, both tactically, that'll change sort of how the game is played, as well as from a player identification standpoint. Let me um, let me pause there for a second, because I know you're in a transition in a second towards some of the business yeah. analytics and strategy analytics as well. But um, do you see the use cases of this being more tied towards aggregate trends So things that look at, for example, how the team functions as a whole, or you can imagine um, you see this in running and other sorts of fitness and and nutrition, the idea of N of one trials. So in other words, here I am as an individual, I don't actually want to know where I fit on a broader uh, normal distribution. What I want to know is how I respond to certain forms of training. So I am the N of one, but there are 365 days a year and 24 hours a day that I'm actually having multiple data points tied towards me and as, as an individual. Is the analytics yeah. space kind of hitting both of those areas? And, and where are there kind of creative use cases emerging? Yeah, I, I think the answer is both. Um, what has been, what is tough about what happened in, in for through, sort of throughout the history of sports is the actual cost necessarily of one player not converting is, is, not that high to a team. Um, but you want to increase the odds that out of the pool of a hundred players that might be in your system, that you're converting a couple of these players to to sort of be superstars or to be contributors. Um, and what I think teams are starting to see is it, it, so what that manifested was this is the way you have to do it. This is the way to that to to optimize the power in your swing or optimize the power in your shot. And so we're going to make everybody do this. And we'll see what players rise to the top because that naturally matches how they might play or how they see the game or their natural skill sets and strengths. Um, and so I think where the teams are and where leagues are shifting is more to that end of one and the understanding that, yes, there are core principles um, that that sort of align with that, but that every player is going to be different. And you can find players that do things very strangely who are very, very successful players. Mm-hmm. Um and so, you know, we have one on our team, very fortunately, um, our, a young hotshot 18 uh, year old who is a very talented hockey player and he shoots the puck almost unlike anybody else. Um, mm-hmm. And that's something that is, is provided him considerable advantage. And it's something that I think in the future, we'll see more and more players who sort of create things that are sort of uniquely their own. And we'll use that to leverage uh, going forward. That's interesting. So going back to some degree to your running background, imagine uh, a cross country team at WashU. I actually see a couple of cross country uh, members on this particular call. Um, you know, the the ability to say how many miles works really well uh, across all athletes is is very different than saying what is the amount of miles that works for a particular athlete. So I'm going to call out Alexandra Blake, for example, a recent All American on the team who runs a relatively low amount of miles compared to some other folks. But that could be the type of thing that prepared her to be an All American. So that whole idea of kind of getting at the individual implications versus the collective implications does seem to be a, a great area of potential. Yeah. And I was one of those people. I could not train uh, like some other folks. And we learned that about halfway through my college career. And so my my training looked very different um, as far as what it took for me to get ready for, for a national meet and for me to stay healthy and for me to run at my best. So yeah. uh, it is something that I've lived and now I'm seeing our, our hockey ops team sort of apply. That's amazing. Now let's transition to the kind of the strategy side of the house. And in this way, you might see a little bit more alignment with other companies, other industries, other spaces 
But as you think about looking out in the landscape of what's happening broadly in the world of strategy and analytics, what's happening uh, in the world of potential sports analytics here around strategy, what are the areas that you think are required to develop the Blackhawks capability for that future? Yeah, I think the biggest thing we're looking at is is consumer technology. Um, that's the biggest opportunity. Fans are constantly, you're going to Starbucks, you're going to you know Chick-fil-A, you're going to United and taking a flight or Southwest. And you're having these really, really strong digital experiences that are oftentimes integrated with your in-person experience. Um, and, and you're basically turning around and going to, to teams and saying, okay, wait, why, why is this not how it works over here? Um, first reason is, you know, because those are massive companies and we have a couple hundred people. Uh, but our job is to make sure that we close the gap on, on how those experiences work. So uh, I think, you know, the, the team in St. Louis is, is one of the best examples of a team that uh, started from the ground up with the stadium and the technology Not together. the Blues, I'm assuming you're talking about here. Now you're talking about the I, soccer my, team. Here. The so Blues. I make sure that we're clarifying. <laughs> yes, maybe the Blues as well, but definitely talking about the uh, the soccer team and, and the ability to build that stadium and build the technology around it to create a really, really seamless experience, very similar to what you might see in, in a Chick-fil-A or, or an experience outside of outside of sports. Um, so that's where we are spending a lot of our time is on that consumer technology. How do we we have a fairly complex uh, we have a fairly complex game day experience. There's lots of places you can come from, lots of things you can do. We have a fairly complex buying experience and digital experience online. Uh, we've got a lot of different content, a lot of things going on at any given point in time. Um, so how can we use uh, our technology to create a remote control to give you the experiences you want uh, at the time you want it to help you guide through your experiences when you're here in person with us, making it simpler for you to uh, to buy a jersey, to buy a ticket, to come, uh, come to United Center. Um, just simplifying the process overall. Technology has a massive uh, potential to do that in in our uh, in our environment because of that complication of how complex it is. Um, I think the other thing that is happening is because sports are fun. A lot of tech will look at us first. A lot of very cool tech. Um, so, for instance, one of the things that we've been sort of on the front lines of back in the E15 days and now here at the Blackhawks is Amazon's just walk out technology. Um, the ability to sort of scan a credit card on the way in. It takes you four seconds to get in. Um, you can grab whatever you want off the wall and pop right out. The biggest things we always hear is people don't want to wait in lines at stadiums. And these have an uncanny ability to get rid of lines, which is really wild to see. Right. So being able to take that really cool technology that we think is is going to continue to expand over the next you know, 10, 20 years, be the first movers, test it in our environments, figure out how it interacts with our fan experience and give our fans something really cool and something new that maybe they haven't seen anywhere else um, to, to really drill in uh, on the pain points they have and, and understanding why they come to games, why maybe they, they haven't come to games um, and sort of using technology to meld with the physical world to help solve some of those things. Yeah, that's great. I, I would imagine what's interesting about sports is the consumer, maybe like all areas, the consumer is having experiences in drastically different industries and starting to compare them. So if I pull up uh, my favorite app, for example, on my iPhone, and it's way less clunky than is my app on the Blackhawks, uh, I'm still comparing those two, even if you have the best app in all of hockey. And so really getting to how the consumer is experiencing this when they're seamlessly moving between a bunch of digital experiences from hopping in an Uber to go to the game, uh, shortly thereafter, hopping on Amazon to order something for Christmas. Uh, all of these things are a part of what they're comparing it to, even if it's not a direct competitor of your world. Yeah. And and I mentioned earlier how we have just tend to have a very ambitious organization as far as, you know, what we want to do to help improve the fan experience and improve how sports works. Um, and, and that's a great example of, you know, we oftentimes will not try to compare ourselves to other organizations in sports. We want to find the people who do it the best understand what makes it the best um, and figure out how we can support that same and how that applies to our world and how we can support that same level of investment um, to create those experiences. Because to your point, whether it's just us knowing that something better is out there or whether it's our fans directly comparing us to things outside of sports, we want to be on that level where we're creating sort of those types of experiences. That's great. Well, I'm going to give you one more question here, and then we're going to start to go to a few of the questions that are coming in because we've got some good ones. Um, several even familiar faces. So fun to see a few of uh, familiar faces, Rick in particular, for example. Um, 
So imagine you're a student or imagine you're a couple years out of your time at WashU. You're 23, 24. You're in a job that turns out is not really energizing you. You're sitting here. You click down at 4.30, an opportunity to listen to Ben speak. And you're sitting here saying, gosh, I want to do more of that in my life. I don't want to work in fill in the blank company. I really want to do sports analytics. I'm really interested in doing this space. For that person, 23, 24, 25, they've got a little bit of analytics experience. They've got a degree from WashU, uh, but they really want to make a pivot into supports. What would be the pathways for them to consider? What, what advice yeah. do you give someone like that? Yeah. So I, the first thing I'll say is, you know, back to our, our conversation on diversity of thought, like there, we have people on our team and, and other teams are the same way that come from everywhere. Um, so there's always different directions, different paths. It entirely depends on what the teams are looking for and, and sort of your background and skill set. There are sort of almost infinite ways to, to sort of get into sports. Say so the first thing I, especially sort of younger students that are interested in analytics, um, we are so fortunate because of the amount of data that is publicly available. Uh, my first recommendation is always just get your hands dirty. Um, do an internship, do an analysis for school, do a case study. Um, I you know, was fortunate enough to, to be in the early days of the Olin Sports Business Program and some of the case study opportunities that came arising out of that were incredibly helpful for me to reference when I was talking about internships um, or talking about uh, full-time roles after school. Um, so my recommendation is always just get your hands dirty, um, to understand what it's like to work with some of this data, regardless, even if it's not in sports, just having those, uh, those environments and things that you can call to, um, when you're having those conversations with people in the industry to basically say like, Hey, this is really something that I'm interested in. I can show you that, uh, both I'm interested in, it, I've invested in it because I've invested some time in it, but also that I have enough baseline understanding that I'm able to do a little bit of analysis. Um, the second thing I'll say is, you know, again, especially for, for younger folks, the way that people often talk about getting into sports is I got to go work for a team. Um, and there's a lot of advantages working for a team. Uh, I think you get a much deeper understanding of the business because you're working across all sorts of different departments. But I obviously didn't. I, that's not where I started out of school. I started on the, the sports consulting side. Um, and for me, that was absolutely the right path. I got super wide exposure. I got to see how organizations worked all across the country. I got to see what was important and not important. Uh, I got to see, you know, how, how, you know, what was best in class across all sorts of things and build relationships with teams all over the country. So that's the other thing I'd say is just be know that there's a million different paths, even within sports, um, to understanding uh, and getting exposure to the types of sort of cool problems that we're so fortunate enough to, to face every day. That's great. Well, I want to go to the question because there's some really great ones on here and also the familiar faces. So I, I want to make sure I hit a few of these. Um, and again, as there's other questions that come up, feel free to do so. We're going to have about 10 or so, 10 or 12 minutes. So I'm going to have you be like rapid fire Ben here on a few of these things. Um, so uh, to start at the top, Jacob has a question around analytics as a service and what you're seeing there. Obviously, your experience with uh, E15 probably gives you some insights there, but what are the firms or what are the interesting things happening in the analytics as a service to the business side or maybe the team performance side in sports? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's always top of mind, um, especially uh, generally in sports. We don't have the biggest front offices. We don't have the biggest analytics teams. Um, so it is constantly a back and forth. I feel like teams are, uh, you know, you bring something in-house, you, you outsource it, you bring it in-house, you outsource it. Um, Teams are generally facing very similar problems, um, things like ticket pricing or how to optimize the venue experience. Uh, but at the same time, every every building is a unique snowflake. Um, and what I really liked about what we did at E15 was my role was to sit and embed it uh, at, in Chicago with the Cubs. Um, I had the backing and the support of what is sort of those types of questions look like across the portfolio, but I was able to distill it down and customize it based on the unique constraints of Wrigley Field. For instance, the building was built in 1912, 1914, um, and was built with no concession stands. So we had different problems than, you know, my friends who may be out in LA with the Dodgers might've had. Um, so I think there's a ton of really incredible companies that are coming out in the, the analytics as a service. Um, a lot of them came from people like myself who worked for teams and, and saw opportunities. Um, and I think they're great opportunities for teams to expand their capabilities, 
um, to be able to, you know, impose analytics in places where they don't have the internal bandwidth to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. But it is a constant balancing act just because of how unique each market is, how unique each team is, and how unique each sport is. Yeah, there's a nice corollary case there to the end of one deep dive with one team totally. to end of 32 across the entire league if you're serving a bunch of them there. Uh, sure. Great. I, I want to go to to one of my favorite recent MBA grads, Rick Deloge. Uh, Rick is wondering about the uh, the use of technology and data to drive the behind the scenes B two B decision making process. So, for example, are you using tech to determine how to price on ice or on boards or ad space, things like that? Yeah, it, constantly. Uh, so we are again because we've got this model of we're going to centralize strategy and analytics and sort of embed it in the different teams. Our corporate partnerships strategy and analytics actually sits with our BSA team, um, but obviously works very close with our corporate partnerships team. So they are directly tied into all of our data sources, looking at um, what is our fan behavior relating to core brands and how can we uh, present that to our brands. They're directly related to anytime we're doing any sort of testing, like, hey, we want to put a partner on you know X, Y, and Z activation. What is the impact that has for the brand? What is the impact that has for us? Um, you know, they're looking at pricing corollaries across the league. They're looking at all of our data on marketing assets and what's garnering attention and what's garnering eyeballs. Um, what are our fans, you know, as opposed to just being a logo slap, but what are our fans actually engaging with? What are they interested in and how do we provide more of that? Um, so it, it's constant for us and it comes from this, this concept of us sort of being, uh, infusing strategy and analytics throughout what we do. Yeah, that's great. I'm going to insert a Peter Baumgarten question here before I go to Mia here, just because it came top of mind for me. And guess what? It's my show, so I get to run it. <laughs> um, but uh, to the point about analytics capabilities, do you have a strong answer on whether or not people should do a particular language, R versus Python versus other things? Well, what should they be upscaling on when it comes to the language side? That's a great question. Um, I always say, so the, the short answer is once you know... Uh, essentially either R or Python or, or a lot of the other programming language, you can very easily or somewhat easily learn the others. So anything is good. Um, my general recommendation is for people who are interested in data analytics, I would always start with SQL because that is a core foundation that is a little bit different um, and is essentially one of the one of the first things that teams who are looking for data analysts will look for is they'll look for that SQL skill and, and look to teach the rest. Between R and Python, I I started on R, I converted to Python. My recommendation is generally to to learn Python because it's just a little bit uh, a little bit broader. If you're only going to learn one, you can do data and, and eh, data analysis and analytics in Python. You can also sort of code basic websites and build data pipelines a little bit easier than you can in R. Um, so. Moral of the story, they're all good. I'd pick any of them if one of them interests you and, and learn it, and you'll be able to figure out the rest. Um, but we generally start with SQL and go to Python if if I had to pick one route. I love how I started with R and stayed with R. And so you basically said there's no future in me for the for the Blackhawks. So I'm gonna stay with the professor Here's for now, but diversity of thought. All, diversity of thought. all the smartest people I know all use R. Um, I will, uh, I will also insert that caveat just as proof that you, you know, you shouldn't actually listen. I'm to no longer show, grading but... you, Ben. So I'm going to, I'm going to allow that to just fly by here. Let's go to a question from Mia. Uh, me in particular is wondering about the shared venue space with the Chicago Bulls who have not started out in quite the way that they wanted to at the start of the season. Um, so she's wondering if given that shared space, given some of the shared facilities, if there's learning cross-pollination across the analytics teams with the Bulls. Yes. So we are, it's interesting. We are one of two venues, I believe, in the country that are truly set up this way. Uh, we have a 50-50 joint venture with the Bulls. We share the building um, and, and there's sort of like a shared entity in the middle that manages it. Uh, the only other place is in Dallas uh, with Mark Cuban, formerly Mark Cuban, with uh, the Mavericks and the Stars. Um, so it prevents all sorts of interesting things um, that teams that own their building uh, or own it with a tenant don't have to deal with. Um, so there's all sorts of fun stuff there. But one of the positive uh, results of that is that we have a pretty strong relationship with the Bulls. Um, and so we have we obviously have a lot of places where we have to work with them. We're selling a sign in the arena. We got to figure out if it's our sign, it's their sign or it's a sign we're going to share um, as, as a very simple example. 
Um, there's all sorts of things like, hey, we want to put in this massive thing for our games, but we need to keep it for 10 games. And they'll say, you know, either great, we want it to stay for our games that are in the middle, um, or if it's something where we need to, you know, take it out and put it down uh, before every game. Um, but we're very fortunate that, you know, I have a very close relationship with their team, as does most of our team. Um, being able to walk downstairs and uh, go talk to another team that is facing a lot of the same problems we are, that is, uh, you know, trying to solve the same same challenges um, is super, super valuable. We spend a lot of time in sports calling other teams just to figure out what they're doing um, and understand their perspective on different things so we can learn and grow in that way. Um, so there is sort of tremendous opportunity for us that uh, we're one of the few places where I can just go downstairs and be able to do the same thing. Yeah. Well, it's interesting going back to some of those A-B testing models, the ability to kind of look at something like a single ad versus a shared ad. What is the click-through rate on these different things? What's the return on investment? Allows you to move from intuition. This was a great ad. My mother-in-law loved it. And they said it was their favorite thing to actually some rigor behind some of those tests. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. A couple, a couple more here because I want to make sure I turn it over in three minutes. So you're going to have to do this pretty rapid fire here. Uh, we have a note from Alexander Blake. I'll read this one directly. Peter, you are too kind. This is our All-American. Thanks for the shout outs. Uh, had to join from the stationary bike like a good cross country would be doing. Um, what are some of the lessons for someone who's coming out of a sports background? So she's asking in particular what you took from your time at Wash U cross country, but imagine there's other Wash U athletes or non-Wash U athletes on the line. W what are some of the takeaways for the the student athlete that goes professional in something other than their sport as the NCAA yeah. likes to brand. I, I will be super concise, but I, I think it all comes down to the work ethic. I always am looking for athletes when I'm hiring and it's because I know that, uh, you know, our job is not, it's, it's not necessarily nine to five. It's not, Hey, I'm going to pick it up and put it down at the end of the day. Um, we're looking for people that are, are going to work hard and, and going to sort of like be really invested and, uh, one of my favorite things about sports is that you've got people that come from these competitive backgrounds that are former athletes or uh, really like sports. And it's one of the few places that you're sort of continuing to pursue that common goal that you have in sports mm -hmm. um, because you're still trying to pursue a, a championship just like you are in college. Uh, so I think that environment garners really sort of a really interesting environment, a really cool environment. Um, and the things you learn as an athlete, how to manage your time, how to work hard, how to work towards your goals are all things that I think pay off in spades, uh, in the professional world. Um, and so it's something that, uh, you know, we've got a, a handful of, of athletes on our team, um, and have all sort of say the same thing as far as how they can apply that background. That's great. Two real quick ones, and I'm going to give you 30 seconds for each Jacob Fisher is asking about the lessons from the pro sports to let's imagine uh, you're up the town college Northwestern team, uh, which might be struggling with, uh, with attendance in a yeah, um, average okay. season, the change of little drama that happened along the team, some other things going on there. Are there, are there lessons around how a team like that should build out their capabilities? Yes. Um, I think it comes down to sort of that, that concept of 80, 20, what are the, the, the quickest, um, lowest impact ways that we can garner the greatest impact. I said that I'm twisted all my words, but um, for every team, there are these sort of quick opportunities to uh, find whether it's inefficiencies, places to automate, um, even just taking a deep dive and having someone who's focused every day on measuring your biggest revenue streams, whether it's retail, ticketing, corporate partnerships, um, just sort of Deep diving onto those areas can really generate, you know, an ROI over and above uh, what that person, you know, would be doing otherwise. Yeah, that's great. Last question. And I think this is a really good one from, from Ben Ross. And in particular, he's wondering about uh, essentially the um, access and equality elements around data. So imagine certain teams, certain players are coming from a data robust environment. Imagine you're a, a well-resourced hockey player from Winneka that all of a sudden can give all the data to like, different colleges or professional teams that are recruiting you. Uh, and instead you're from a rural town, that's a really great hockey player, but there's a lot less robust data. Are, are there things that teams need to do on the player side to level the playing field when it comes to the lack of access to data or the lack of robustness of data? Yeah, I think honestly, one they're, they're doing this all the time as far as just going out and, and, and reaching out to blend the analytics with the in-person communication. Um, we've got scouts all over the place whose job it is to 
to not only take the data, but also to just go look and meet these kids and, and understand where they're coming from, understanding their background, um, to really blend these things together helps us avoid the pitfalls that may come from becoming too focused on the analytics. Um, and weirdly enough, a lot of times the analytics will sort of inform uh, either create from what those scouts are giving back to us. So analyzing their reports to understand the trends in their reports, if it's a place where we maybe don't have a lot of data, or even just informing, hey, where should they be going? Because there's large portions of the, the world and the country that uh, we have to make a targeted effort to get to, because obviously that's a lot of ground to cover. Um, and so using analytics to sort of drive that piece of it as well. That's great. Well, Ben, real pleasure on my end to be able to spend some time with you. It's been fun to follow your career along the way and obviously to reconnect during this particular time. Uh, but but uh, excited to see what you will do to make sure that the Blackhawks are near the top in the league for those of you St. Louis Blues fans that are on the line. Uh, but great to see the work that you're doing here. Absolutely. And I appreciate you having me. Of course. Uh, before we go, just stay on here for one more minute. I would love to be able to welcome in Claire Sheehan from the WashU Grad Admissions Office. And Claire's going to give you just a few updates to close out our time together. Uh, but really appreciate it all the time. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. Hi, everyone. Um, as Peter mentioned, I'm Claire Sheehan with WashU Olin's graduate recruitment team. I want to just extend another thank you to both Ben and Peter for being with us today. I think it's safe to say we've all learned so much and have a genuine appreciation for the impact of using data and the role that context plays in evaluating the information before us. Um, and I would say today's discussion aligns with the kind of leadership that students develop here at WashU Olin, particularly in our graduate programs. Um, a WashU Olin MBA, for example, helps prepare students to be values-based data-driven leaders and equips them to thrive in today's global changing world. And we offer our MBA in a variety of part-time formats for working professionals. Um, first, we have our online MBA, which is 100% online and is designed for those who aim to understand digital technology and use it as a business strategy. We also offer our on-campus professional MBA program, which has flexibility built in for people looking to expand their network and advance their careers. And last but not least, we also offer our executive MBA program, which is designed for senior leaders who aspire to C-suite careers. So if you've been considering getting your MBA, we invite you to learn more about these programs at our next virtual information session entitled Application Tips for Professional Programs. And that will be on December 13th from 5 to 5.45 p.m. Central Standard Time. So you can register in two ways, use the QR code there on the screen, and we're also sharing a link in the chat if that is easier. So in closing, thank you all once again for attending today's Leadership Perspectives. This is actually our final Leadership Perspectives event for 2023. We will return in January with more Leadership Perspectives events, including our annual 66060 event, and this is a jam-packed 60 minutes with 60 unique ideas for success from six executives. So this is a lightning round panel with great advice that you won't want to miss. So be sure to check out our Leadership Perspectives event page for details on our upcoming events and how to register. Until then, we wish you all a wonderful holiday season, and we look forward to seeing you in the new year. Have a wonderful evening. Take care.